so fun to be in a new space as a church, but really it wouldn't matter because wherever we gather, it's just a a, a family reunion. It's a joy to be together, to talk together, to worship together. Wouldn't bother me if we were in a barn <laughs> and uh, we could sing and, and hear God's word preached, so... But I am grateful for the gift of this facility, something that God really has, has led us to that I think is going to serve us. Um, I do want to make a couple of, of requests as we're in this facility. One is we, we, want to, we want to treat this facility well as a church. Obviously, this is used week, week by week uh, by teachers and students, administrators. So we want to serve them. So if you can kind of help the kids get used to a couple things, if you have children especially, I assume parents won't be pulling things off the walls. If you do, then, then let me ask you not to do that either. Uh, but, but for your children especially, if you can just kind of keep an eye on them, that we don't want to be ripping down their decorations or anything like that. Also, um, because this stage is kind of new, I know there's a lot of kids that are going to want to be up here and checking everything out. And we are going to just request that the kids kind of stay off the stage so we're not knocking over speakers on the people and... Uh, it'd be a bad way to intro this building. So, uh, anyway, a couple of things like that, and and, and then the, the other thing is just uh, just just enjoy the space. I mean, the, the the hope is that this allows us to fellowship after churches on Sunday. That we don't feel you know quite as cramped. We can hang out and talk. Um, we we have it for plenty of time after church, so there's no need to rush home. We actually appreciate that time after church as a moment in the week when the church is together, when you can kind of catch up with each other. Uh, so please, we would encourage you, if you can, if you don't need to, but if you can, to stay afterwards this Sunday and subsequent Sundays as well, just to enjoy each other and enjoy fellowship as well. So looking forward to being here uh, as a church. Well, if you'd open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to be looking at just the first two verses this morning. I want to, I want to read them and then I'll... I'll talk a little bit about this book in general and why I'm excited to start into a new series on the Sunday that we start into this new building. And you'll have to forgive my, my voice, and if I abruptly turn away, and I hope my mic will go muted by our very skillful sound engineer, uh, split-second ability is going to be present this morning. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I am battling a little bit of a cough, so I appreciate your prayers as well. Uh, but let's, uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll talk about this whole book. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you. Grace to you. Grace to you. And peace. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This book, uh, Ephesians, has been uh, in our horizon. We've been looking forward to it pastorally for a long time now, looking forward to examining it in detail. And part of the reason we've been looking forward to it is is just unique to the book, and the other reason is, is more pastoral, what we hope to glean out of it. Ephesians is simply one of the most beloved sections of Scripture. Many, many Christians uh, would consider Ephesians one of their favorite letters in the New Testament, certainly. Uh, it, it is just rich and profound and diverse in all the topics that it represents. I, I wanted to read a quote by a commentator uh, and you'll hear me quote him a lot throughout the book of Ephesians. So I just want to introduce him to you this morning. His name is Harold Honer. And he has this excellent quote describing the historical value of Ephesians. So I wanted to read it to you this morning. It says this. The letter to the Ephesians is one of the most influential documents in the Christian church. John Calvin considered Ephesians as his favorite letter. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the great poet and philosopher, wrote 
in May 25th, 1830, regarding Ephesians, it is one of the divinest compositions of man. It embraces every doctrine of Christianity. In 1903, J. Armitage Robinson considered Ephesians as the crown of St. Paul's writings. And in 1999, Peter T. O'Brien claims the letter to the Ephesians is one of the most significant documents ever written. Now, <laughs> that is a star-studded cast of brilliant people applauding the value of this book to our souls. Uh, this book was written by the Apostle Paul, as the opening verse states. If you don't know very much about his story, Paul was a, a religious zealot who was far from God. He basically made a living by persecuting the church immediately after Jesus' death and resurrection. But he was saved. He was radically saved on a road. The risen Lord appeared to him, literally knocked him off of his horse, and commissioned him to be the apostle to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish world. So this is, this is Paul. That happened uh, sometime around 34, 35 AD, sometime in that range. And, and Paul went on what you might call apostolic or missionary journeys, traveling from the city of Antioch around the known Roman world at the time. He went on several different journeys, and he planted the church in Ephesus, this city that's now in modern-day Turkey. He planted it on his second apostolic journey. And after planting the church, he eventually returned there and spent a couple of years there teaching and proclaiming the gospel. And then when he was about to be imprisoned later in his life, he called the elders of this church uh, to him and warned them and instructed them. You can read that wonderful speech in Acts chapter 20. Now, he, he writes this letter, we, we think, based on some of the uh, references in the letter, from prison, probably in Rome, about A.D. 62. So this would have been 30 years after his conversion, and, and perhaps 10 years after he planted the church. So the church might be about 10 years old at this point. And Paul uh, writes this letter to encourage them in the faith. Now, to speak generally about the theology of Ephesians, let me just say something briefly. The theology uh, of Ephesians is basically about God's purpose in Jesus Christ to unite all things under him that the, the brokenness, the alienation that is present in this world towards God and towards one another will ultimately be resolved through God's purposes in him. You might think of a theme verse as, as happening when, when Paul says that God's purpose is to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And then he explains how God does that in Christ by walking through uh, first the, the spiritual blessings that a Christian has received in Christ in chapter 1 and then in chapter 2 he talks about personally what that journey was like how we were we were dead in sin and then God reconciled us exclusively by his grace and then in chapter 3 he talks about how that reconciliation was not just vertical it was also horizontal that God was building a people together what you might call a new humanity a new creation the seed form of which is present in the church on earth a, a, a new humanity that will eventually become God's new universe that he ruled over, where all rebellion is eradicated. And then chapter 4 and 5, he walks through what it looks like to live out this miracle towards one another in this body called the church. And then chapter 6, he describes the armor, the protection that we've received as Christians to fight the spiritual warfare that is ongoing until the Lord Jesus accomplishes his final victory. So it's all about this, this purpose of God to save and, and bring back together, or perhaps renew is a better word, this fallen, broken creation into a new humanity to bring all of us together under Christ to save those that he has, he has called, he has chosen, to finally destroy all opposition, whether of sinners or of Satan, the devil, this world, that, that all things will be brought into their proper order under Christ. And that those of us that are included are included exclusively by the grace of God, unmerited favor. That, that's Ephesians. That's what Ephesians is, is talking about. 
so much in this book for us to benefit from. Now, that's Ephesians objectively. I, I, I want to speak also to what, what we're hoping to accomplish in this book pastorally. Why, why do we choose Ephesians? Obviously, the, the Bible is big. There's a lot of books we could choose to go through. Um, we chose Ephesians uh, most obviously because we, we want you to know this book. We want you to know it. So this is kind of a straightforward reason. We want to say that our church knows the book of Ephesians. We want it to be one of those books that you have a, a handle on, that you can go to in your devotions, your quiet time reading, or your, your private fellowship or whatever, and you can say, yeah, I, I have a good sense of Ephesians. I, I know basically the structure of it. I know basically the themes, the, the teaching. I know why I could go there, what I'm looking for. We want our church to know Ephesians. So I would make that a personal goal as we go through the book. This isn't just isolated messages. Uh, we're not just kind of choosing Ephesians to launch into some topics we're hoping to, to find out about. No, we, we want everyone here to, to know this book more deeply, more profoundly, to, to sort of make it your own. We also are hoping that our church will be changed by this book. I don't mean that word correctively, as though we, we see problems and we want to correct them. No, I, I mean that we would be uh, renewed, we would be uh, benefited, we would grow increasingly up into our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. We would mature in the gospel through this book. Um, we want to see us grow in a couple of different ways. We want to we want to grow in our treasuring of the gospel. Uh, Ephesians has some magnificent passages describing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you might remember passages like, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, but God made you alive, right? You might know passages like that. Or when we sang this morning, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. That, that's in Ephesians. And so we want us to have this this higher view, this more astonished view of the gospel, that it would not just be familiar or commonplace among us. It, it would be dear and, and rich and deep to us as we look at this book. We're also hoping that, that our view of the church, this new humanity that God has created, what Paul describes as the mystery, God's glorious mystery, now unveiled that a humanity encompassing every tribe and language and people and nation will be brought under Christ and will be God's new purpose to establish this for his worship now and forever. So we're hoping that, that our view of the church will be elevated to match what Paul says in Ephesians. We're also hoping that we'll have a, a fresh and an excited view of the power of God. Ephesians talks about God's power in Christ. That we've been given power through the gospel message to fight the spiritual warfare that is ongoing until Jesus returns. So we're, we're hoping that, that God will, will, will do that among us. And I, I just want to encourage you that you would, you would pray. I was thinking this week, I was preparing this message and thinking about it. I thought, you know, what's, I, I think the hardest part of preaching is the desire to make familiar truths freshly exciting. I think that may be the hardest part of preaching. I thought, you know, one of the key tools of that happening um, is, is that when we come to hear God's word, we would pray and that our, our hearts would be positioned to be freshly inspired, freshly motivated by God's word. So I would encourage you to do that as we go through Ephesians, because that's, that's not something I can do. I mean, I can prepare and, and you know work hard and so forth, but but I want to encourage you that you would pray that God would freshly inspire your heart whenever you come to hear Aaron or, or myself preach through this, this book. That, that you would come ready to be freshly inspired by maybe familiar truth. I, I, I want to just encourage you to, to do that because that's not something no amount of preparation is as effective as those of us that are coming to hear God's word, praying in advance and preparing our hearts. The best preparation can't compare uh, to advanced prayer uh, by listeners of the gospel preaching. So I just want to encourage you to do that. Well, that is an overview. That, that's why we're going through this book. That, those are the reasons we thought it would, it, would va it would be greatly valuable to us. We're coming into our, our third year as a church, 
And even now, there's things that can become familiar. We can become familiar with the gospel. We've heard it now for a couple of years, proclaimed from this pulpit, but, but we don't want to become familiar with it. We want it to be freshly inspiring. We've, we've gotten to know one another, and we have new people coming into our church, but we don't want church community to become familiar or commonplace or ordinary. We want to be freshly inspired for the, the privilege we have, and Ephesians talks all about that. And, as I mentioned in a previous message, after a couple of years, a church plant, some of the newness adrenaline starts to wear off. It's not brand new and sparkling anymore. And so we want to have a, a fresh confidence in the power of God to do beyond what we could ask or imagine. All of those things are present in Ephesians. So I think this, this book really speaks right to where we're at as a church, moving into our third year, moving past what we might call the initial phase of this church plant. So, having said all that as an introduction, let me dive into these first couple of verses. Paul <laughs> uses ordinary letter introductions, ordinary letter introductions, to accomplish theological preparation. Let me say that again. Paul uses ordinary letter introductions. This is an ordinary letter introduction. Ordinary letters at that time would have identified the sender, identified the receiver, and then given some kind of greeting. So this is not out of the ordinary for Paul to do something like this, but Paul infuses his greetings with theological preparation. He is preparing the Ephesians for what they will hear and receive as the letter unfolds. And so if you if you read other letters of the Apostle Paul, don't just skip over these opening lines. Actually, I was astonished this week to think how much truth, how many themes of the letter are packed into these two verses. Over the course of two verses, Paul has introduced virtually every theme he's going to write about in the next six chapters. So there's, there's great value, there's great richness. You could probably do much much worse than to focus your meditation on the first greetings of each of the letters of Paul. It'd be a wonderful meditation. And, and if I could summarize this, this opening invitation, what Paul is basically wanting the Ephesians to hear and receive is the good news of Jesus Christ. He wants them to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what he, if you could put it in, in modern kind of vernacular, he would say, greetings, receive the good news of Jesus Christ. Receive it. Receive it. And I'll talk about it now for six chapters so that it's not superficial. But I want you to receive it. That's how I'm going to greet you. That's how I'm going to bless you before we get started. I want you to receive it. And he does this by emphasizing two things we have to receive. First of all, we have to receive a gospel identity. And we have to receive gospel blessings. Receive gospel identity and receive gospel blessings. Gospel identity is on Paul's mind when he identifies himself and the saints who are on Ephesus. Let's just notice this. First of all, himself, Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus. By the will of God. I just note something. What what comes to Paul's mind when he is seeking to identify who he is, is his calling and his belonging to Jesus Christ. That's what comes to Paul's mind. I'm an apostle. That means a sent one, a, a commissioned messenger, someone who's given a message and given the authority to proclaim that message, which is encouraging to us because it means this book written by this man was commissioned by God himself. Jesus Christ himself sent Paul to give these words to us. But I also want to point out that in, in Paul's self-reflection, how he thinks about himself, is primarily one that belongs to Christ Jesus. He belongs to Jesus. That's Paul's self-identity. And he belongs to Jesus not by any choice of his own, not because he thought of himself in some particular way or he chose this office of apostle or he wanted to uh, you know, be impressive in the, in the you know, first century church. No, he says this is by the will of God. God has chosen this calling and task for me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I belong to him. I'm identified by him. And this calling was not my own doing. It is exclusively the will of God. Paul thinks of himself in terms of the gospel 
that has commissioned him and called him. Now, no one here, no one here is called to be an apostle like Paul was. Paul was unique. Paul was given a unique commission like Peter and James and John and the other 12. Unique authority, unique commission. They were allowed to write scripture. Nobody here and nobody on alive today or will be alive in the future is, is able to have that commission. However, we can glean from Paul's self-identity because that's true of every Christian here today. Every Christian here today is called as a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every Christian is called to identify themselves with Jesus Christ. And every Christian, as Paul will make very clear in chapter 2, is associated with Jesus Christ exclusively because of the will of God. And we, we know that identity, that gospel identity, is on Paul's mind because that's how he addresses the people in Ephesus. Notice how he infuses this greeting with theology. Uh, Harold Honer, the, the commentator, again, has a great quote on this. He says, As the sender, Paul gives his credentials and gives a description of the recipients, indicating, indicating this, indicating that both sender and recipients are related to Jesus Christ. And listen to this final sentence. His greeting is adorned with theological content. His greeting is adorned with theological content, specifically the content of establishing their identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how he describes them. He's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. They are the saints who are in Ephesus. Now, we don't perhaps feel the effect of that, but <laughs> Ephesus was a pagan city. Not unlike other cities of the time, potentially, but, but a pagan city. There was false worshipers there. It was dominated by Rome at the time. So the emperor was very highly uh, worshipped even uh, in that time and culture. So, so to be saints set apart, was that, that word could be used to describe the temple materials, things that are given unique access to God, things that are allowed to approach the presence of God. So you're, you're, you're the holy ones, you're the set apart ones that are in physically in the city of Ephesus, most of the inhabitants of which have no interest in God whatsoever. So, so you are this, this holy enclave of consecrated people inside this physical city. Your identity is first that you're set apart by God. Your circumstances are that you are inside this city of Ephesus. And he keeps going. You're faithful in Christ Jesus. That, that word doesn't, doesn't particularly mean, um, it, it basically what he's describing there is you are those who are found within Christ. Your identity is in Christ. You are those who are believing the believers who are in Christ. So what Paul's doing here is he's taking, taking Jewish terminology and he's applying it to the church. There's temple-like holiness, except now they are people, and they are people not in Jerusalem, but in a pagan city. There's faithful believing, but they are not simply faithful believers in this land of Israel. No, now there is a new location for their faithful believing, and that is in Christ Jesus. You, you live in a city but you really live in Christ Jesus. You might be physically located in Ephesus, but you're actually called out ones belonging to God. You might be faithful, but you're not faithful in just some general, even some historic Jewish way. You are faithful in the person of Jesus Christ. I just noticed something. Do you notice the one thing that is related three times in two verses? Look down at your Bibles. You always want to notice repetition in Paul. What's the one thing? You look at it. What, what's, what's one thing that's referenced three times in two verses? I'll give you a chance to look at it real quick. One thing. Verse 1, he's the apostle of Christ Jesus. They are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't think the Ephesians are dumb. 
and he's not dumb. He basically is saying, let me make it absolutely clear what is going to be most important in this letter, more important than anything else. Actually, I'm going to say it three times in two verses before we get anywhere off the shoot. And actually, if you read, you keep reading through the end of chapter one, he keeps repeating, in Christ Jesus, in him, in whom, in him, in him you have been this, in him you have been blessed, in him you have been saved, in him you have been adopted. Gospel identity is foundational to Paul, and it's foundational for Paul as he relates to the saints in Ephesus. They're the called out ones who are faithful in Christ Jesus. And most likely that phrase, in Christ Jesus, it describes both the word saints and the word faithful. So they're saints and they're faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, let me ask you what may be a personal question, but you don't have to embarrass yourself by answering. Have you ever been pulled over by a police officer and panicked, wondering if you actually had your identification, or your registration, or your insurance? If you have never panicked, God bless your administrative gifting. I have. I frequently panic. I panic when I see police officers because I wonder, do I... Have I replaced the latest insurance card? I hope I have. I know I got it. Did I put it in there? I'm not sure. And there's a thing that police officers do. I'm sure there's a very good reason for them to do it, but they do it here in Round Rock. I, I've never experienced it before. And maybe it's just me. So if this doesn't happen to you, don't tell me that because that'll make me feel bad. They kind of follow you around for a while. I never experienced that before. They're not pulling you over. They're just following you around. So, you know, there's times I'll, I'll, I'll be driving, I'll be on the phone, and I'll notice a, like recently, there was a large SUV police sheriff something just behind me. And he just camped out there. I don't drive particularly fast. I, I don't know why. I, I'm just there, and I'm trying to talk on the phone, and I'm distracted by this person behind me. And so I, I, I'm, I'm something of a wimp when it comes to being pulled over. So I, I typically just pull in somewhere <laughs> because I don't know. I, I mean, I'm like, this never happened to me before. I don't know why they're doing this. I mean, pull me over or not, I can't handle the pressure right now, okay? So, so I typically, I was on the phone with somebody the other day. There's this person behind me. I was like, you know what? Hang on just a second. I just pulled in. i like, look, I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm pulling in here. If you're coming in, come on in. You can, whatever I did, great. If not, you can just keep on driving. But I'm not driving for the next three miles if you camped out behind me because I can't deal with this, right? Well, well, part of the concern there is I don't, I don't know what, what happened. And sometimes when, when I see that police officer coming, and especially now they follow you around, I, I wonder, oh, gosh, do I, ha I hope I have. Do I have the latest insurance? Did I, maybe I missed it in the mail or maybe it just passed or... I, do I have my wallet? I have my wallet. Yeah, I always have my wallet. It, all this stuff goes through my mind. Well, why is that important? Well, it's because the first thing that happens when you roll down that window is they ask for that stuff. They don't even tell you what you did wrong. You might have done nothing wrong. You might be perfectly innocent, and they just wanted to compliment you on your turn signal and, and, and just say, what a great turn signal. But if you don't have that stuff, now all of a sudden you're in trouble. Even if you did nothing wrong. Thanks for pulling. I had a police officer <laughs> pull me over one time. And the first thing he said was, do you know why I pulled you over? He, I said, no. I, 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 I know I, maybe I was going too fast in this one particular. Well, you actually were going way too slow um, on, this, on this particular road. I said, well, I, I know I was, but I saw you get behind me. And I, I thought maybe you were pulling me over for going too fast. And I didn't want to just speed away from you. And so he kind of. I did some some version of a police mocking laughter, and he he moved on. But but I thought, yeah, I, I you got to have that stuff, and I'm always nervous I don't have it right or it's the wrong thing or whatever. Paul is basically wanting to say to the Ephesians, you've been given an identity so precious, so valuable. It's not an identity you can use, you can lose or leave at the house or forget to replace or something. But it is an identity that you can forget about. It's an identity you can forget about. And as you're driving along the road of life, you can suddenly panic and not be quite sure what to do. Because life is coming up behind you and you're not quite sure, where, where is my identity? W what is my identity? We have something like identity amnesia as Christians. We forget our, Now, we remember all kinds of other identities. 
don't we? We, 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 we typically you don't forget, uh, you know, that you're married. Although I, I did have one person uh, that I heard a story about one time that after they got married, um, they they went home from work and they went home to their childhood home, uh, went in a long day at work, I guess, and and went upstairs and just went to bed. Sometime in the middle of the evening, uh, his mother came up and said, "Is everything all right?" And at that point, he shot up and said, "My wife." And, and he went, and I thought, well, that's a new level of having a hard day at work. Um, God bless them, they're still married, and God bless her. Um, but normally, normally, we don't forget those kinds of things, do we? We don't forget basic, fundamental identity like that. Normally, we don't. But we forget gospel identity all the time. We forget it all the time. How do I know that? We do who we think we are. We do who we think we are. If we're the most important person on the road, we get angry at other people. If we're the person who will be respected, we demand respect from others. If we're the person who should be served, we have a hard time serving. If we're the person who desperately needs rest because the week has been long, we watch something for six hours. We do who we think we are. And so I know that we forget gospel identity all the time. If we are a sinner trying to earn their way to heaven, we feel bad about our sin and work hard until we feel better about ourselves because we do who we think we are. Paul is determined. He is determined. He takes their gospel identity before he says anything else to them. He's got a lot to say. Anything else. He duct tapes it to their face and says, this you will not forget. This you will not forget. You are called out ones. You are believing. <clears throat> and you are in Christ Jesus. That's your identity. You're in Christ Jesus. Oh yeah, you're in Ephesus. You're called out ones. You have stuff for you to do. You have to live out that identity. But you're in Christ Jesus. You belong to Jesus Christ like I do. It's by the will of God. Gospel identity shapes how we live. We must receive a fresh, receive a fresh view of, receive a fresh affection for our gospel identity. Who are you? I am in Christ Jesus should be the first and most passionate answer you give. I give. Let me, let me ask you a question. If somebody asked you that question, who are you? Really, who are you? Would your most natural, emotionally joyful answer be, I am in Christ Jesus? Be honest with yourself. It's okay if your answer is, I don't think that'd be my first answer. But let's let Paul change us. Let's let him change us. He wants that to be our first emotional, functional answer. Who are you? An engineer? Athletic? Intellectual? Philosophical? Passionate? I, I, I'm a military person. I'm a hardworking person. I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I, I, I'm, I'm artistic. I mean, you, you come up with a substitute legitimate identity, but is that the first thing that comes to mind? License registration, please. I'm an artist. Nice, but not what I need. <laughs> Paul wants that to be the first thing. Here you go. I am in Christ Jesus. So that every moment along the road, every moment as you're walking through life, you would say, I'm in Christ Jesus. That is the first and most important thing I have to say about myself. I have to say about another Christian, you're in Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus. Yes, but I'm a sinner. But you're in Christ Jesus. 
Yes, but I'm a failing mother. But you're in Christ Jesus. Yes, but I, I've, I've struggled this week. Yes, but you're in Christ Jesus. Yes, but I'm, I'm not sure I've been, I've been faithful in my small group attendance. Yes, but you're in Christ Jesus. But, but I haven't reached out in the gospel. Yes, but you're in Christ Jesus. Yes, but I, I fear for the future. You're in Christ Jesus. Have no fear for the future. Gospel identity shapes the way we think and how we live. We need to think it for ourselves. We need to impress it on others. Receive gospel identity. Also, receive gospel blessing. Receive gospel blessing. Grace to you, Paul says, and peace. This is something like a benediction. You think of it that way. Receive grace and peace. Grace <laughs> grace is this magnificent word. Magnificent gospel word. Magnificent word in Ephesians. It means... As Harold Honer again says, God's unmerited or undeserved favor in providing salvation for sinners through Christ's sacrificial death and enablement for the believer, it is no mere introductory cliche. It is the gospel in one word. I, I, I agree with the acronym that people have used where you could think of grace as God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a, that's a decent summary of what grace is. God's riches at Christ's expense. So when he says grace, he, he's not saving them for the first time. It's important to realize that. Paul wishes grace upon people who have already been saved. Receive the lesson in that. He wishes grace upon people who have already received grace emphatically once and for all. We should receive instruction by the fact that he does that. What that means is that we, it doesn't mean that we could lose the grace we've received. I don't think that's what he means at all. It's not, he's not re-saving them again. But he is reviewing with them the fact that they have received grace, which apparently they need and we need. See, you can't lose the grace that you can receive, but you can't forget about it. You can functionally misplace it. And so just like with gospel identity, he wants to enumerate gospel blessings in such a way that they, they receive them functionally and experientially again. <clears throat> so he says grace and peace. Let me read you something of a technical quote, but if you can hang with me, I think it'll be worth it. The second term, irene, peace, appears in the LXX, that's the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, 290 times. 290 times. And almost always translate the common greeting of the old Semitic world. The Hebrew tomb had the idea of well-being in the very broadest sense. You might know the phrase Shalom. So the, the Greek words, we're talking Hebrew, Hebrew is shalom. The Greek word that translates the word shalom, which means God's restful well-being. This is such a rich word. God's restful well-being, the goodness of God displayed in your protection, the eschatological reality of God's bringing them into the land and the, the shalom, the blessedness that they were to experience in that, that, that is translated by this word peace. So he's saying grace to you, favor towards you, and peace towards you. So Honer again says, therefore, grace expresses the cause, God's gracious work, and peace, the effect of God's work, the grace of God that brings salvation to sinners affects peace between them and God. And that same grace enables believers to live peaceably with one another. He's saying this to people that are already saved. It is, it is wrong thinking that because we have been saved once, we never need to remember the gospel again. Wrong thinking. We've been saved once. The gospel, message, blessing, identity are themes rightly reserved for the non-Christian, but quickly forgotten about by the Christian. Not according to Paul. Remember, the church was planted 10 years ago. I'll guarantee you he preached all about grace when he planted the church. 10 years old, this church is. 
What does he say to them? Grace. Receive grace and peace. Why? Because Christians have gospel amnesia. We forget about the gospel. It doesn't render it untrue for us. It doesn't remove our salvation. But functionally, we forget about it. And we miss out on the benefits. And so Paul says, remember, receive again the fresh story for your soul again. Come to it as though for the first time. Grace and peace. The well-being that God promised his people. The favor that is undeserved. Enjoy them again. Enjoy them again. And their blessing is not only in, in what's given to us, but in the new relationship we have uh, with God, which Paul states as these come from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that there is this new relationship where God is no longer our judge, or, or even merely a deity that we worship from a distance, but he's become our father. He's adopted us. The, the favor, the unmerited favor and the shalom, the well-being of God that is brought into our life is not brought by a distant deity, occasionally interested. It's brought by someone who has called us his own children, who has claimed us as his own and has brought us under the lordship, the sovereignty, the kingship of Jesus Christ. So the, the sovereign ruling king, a very important word, Kyrios, lord, uh, in the midst of the Roman world where the emperor was lord, Paul, again, is, is, he's realigning their identities, pointing out, you, you, you're under a different lord. You're under a different lord. You're, you're under the Lord Jesus Christ, and God is your Father. And what those two who are one bring to you through the agency of the Holy Spirit is grace and peace. Apart from the work of the gospel, this letter would read, Judgment and divine warfare to you from God the judge and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is his executioner. That's what the gospel does. That's what it reverses. Now, most people here, maybe not everybody, if, if you're here and you've never heard this before, let me tell it to you for the first time. If you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, grace, the favor of God, and the, the spiritual well-being that you need, it is yours simply for the asking. Because Jesus Christ died on a cross to pay for the sins of those who would believe in him. So if you, if you confess your sins and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then this greeting applies to you. Grace and peace from God, the God who made you. He becomes your father. You're no longer ultimately under the, the whims of the gods of this world. You're, you're under God who is the only true God. But for those of us that, that have believed in Jesus, we need to remember gospel blessings because we live with a kind of gospel amnesia. I, I, I've been hearing people say, you have to re-preach Preach again, preach the gospel to yourself every day. I, I've been hearing that for 20 years. But I forget. I forget because you know you know what? Believing in the value of being gospel-centered is not the same thing as being gospel-centered. Believing in the value of rehearsing the gospel to yourself is not the same thing as rehearsing the gospel to yourself. I, I spoke about this about prayer. You know, all of us nod and affirm that's good to pray. That's not praying. That's affirming it's good to pray. The same thing is true of the gospel. It's good to be gospel centered. That's not being gospel centered. That's agreeing. That's like saying, I agree that running is really helpful for you. I agree. Thanksgiving dinner is delicious. That's not the same thing as running or eating. Don't be deceived to think that because you affirm gospel-centered living, your lives are centered on the gospel. Don't be deceived. I can be deceived. 
I mean, I preach this stuff every week and read books about it and have heard messages for decades now. But I can be deceived. I can go day after day after day after day. And I just kind of vague sense that I'm supposed to be aware of the gospel. That's very different from getting on the gospel treadmill and actually rehearsing and reviewing the truth or enjoying the taste of the gospel, actually repeating to myself the truth that in Christ I have received unmerited favor. The blessing, the shalom of God has been given to me in Christ Jesus, that I'm a called out one, called to him, belonging to him, no longer under God's wrath, now under God's grace, set apart by grace for God, headed for glory Now, it's one thing to affirm all of those things as true. It's another thing to repeat them to myself and proclaim. I am identified by the gospel and I've received gospel blessings. That's what Paul's doing. I know you're saved, Ephesians. I know you've already been saved. I want to remind you again of your salvation. You need to receive and remember again tomorrow morning. You'll have forgotten the message already. I'm not offended by that. I probably will have forgotten most of the message already tomorrow morning. Wednesday morning, it'll be a distant memory. What did, what did we talk about on Sunday? I can't remember. You'll be in the middle of your week. Work will have been difficult. You'll have sinned nine or ten times, or for me, 90 or 80, you know, 800. You, you, you'll be struggling in relationships. Fresh temptations will have come. The week will roll forward, and the gospel will be something you affirm on the shelf that isn't open before your eyes. My favorite author for Christians to read, Jerry Bridges, says this. The gospel is not only the most important message in all of history. It is the only essential message in all of history. Yet, we allow thousands of professing Christians to live their entire lives without clearly understanding it, and experiencing the joy of living by it. Christians are not instructed in the gospel, and because they do not fully understand the riches and glory of the gospel, they cannot preach it to themselves, not live by it in their daily lives. He continues, To preach the gospel to yourself, then, means, means, here's what it means functionally, it means that you continually face up to your own sinfulness and then flee to Jesus, Through faith in his shed blood. Now, again, you're not saving yourself each time you do this. You're just rehearsing what is true about you. You're rehearsing. This is true. I am a sinner. Fresh evidence this week of that. But I cast all of my sins on the Lord Jesus. I have cast them and I cast them afresh. And I remember again and receive that in his death I have forgiveness. You must flee to Jesus through faith in his shed blood and righteous life. It means that you appropriate, again, by faith, the fact that Jesus fully satisfied the law of God, that he is your propitiation, that means a a sacrifice producing favor, and that God's holy wrath is no longer directed towards you. What... What motivates us to draw near to God? Rehearsing the gospel. What helps us to see more of God's character and benevolence towards us? Remembering the gospel. What motivates us to actually live holy lives, to do the right thing and avoid the wrong thing? Remembering the gospel. What motivates us to love one another when we face those those prickly Christians that are now requiring us to overlook a multitude of sins again? Rehearsing the gospel? What gives us hope when we look into an uncertain future for ourselves or our kids? Rehearsing the gospel. What is the life of Christian life? It is rehearsing and reviewing the gospel. But if we try to run this race without doing that, we are like the marathon runner who turns to that side water fountain again and again and then says, I have no need of you. We attempt to do all the right things and read and pray and serve and love and worship without the water that is intended to sustain us. So Paul, introducing this most divinest, as Clover says, divinest of compositions, he stakes his claim. Here, stay 
here. I know you've been Christians 10 years. Not impressive, because Christians forget the gospel like everybody does. I know it's easy to think you should move on to other things. I know it's tempting to think you can now live in your own strength. I know it's tempting to think that you can accomplish the Christian life without rehearsing the things because you've already been back there. He says, no, go back there again. Go back there again. Review again. Remember again. Preach the gospel to yourself again. Grace to you, Ephesians. Grace to you and peace. From God, who by his own will has become your Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive your gospel identity. Remember gospel blessings. Receive again the good news of Jesus Christ. Receive it again. You are not too old. Let me, let me, let me make one final point here. Paul has been a Christian 30 years when he writes the book of Ephesians. Now, I dare anyone to read Ephesians and doubt that Paul's heart was not inflamed by the gospel he was preaching 30 years after receiving it. Paul does not grow weary of rehearsing and reviewing gospel truth because he's found the gospel to be endlessly delightful, infinitely full of riches to freshly inspire and motivate him. There's nothing to move on to. There's only deeper understandings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because this is the life of everything else in the Christian life. Receive, he says. I'm going to dive into a, a thousand details. We're going to swim around in this truth for a long time. Receive. Receive the good news again. So for you, Redemption Hill Church, receive the good news again. Grace. Peace. God is your Father. You are in Christ Jesus. Receive the good news of the gospel again. And take it with you this week. Fix it in your mind. Make an appointment in your mind right now. A daily appointment with the gospel. Make an appointment you don't miss. Let's pray. Lord, we rejoice in you. We thank you and we love you and we are so grateful to you. Thank you that you have imprinted our identity on your hands. You have written your name on our souls so that we cannot lose it. We pray, Lord, that for each member of this church, you would, you would cause us to have a, an appointment with these truths day by day. That we would enjoy and rejoice. And I, Lord, I pray for the benefit of this book as we as we dig deeply into this vast mine of gospel treasures, that you would reveal your glory to us, reveal your truth to us, draw us closer to you and closer to each other. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.